1 Corinthians 9, 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but that one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain. And everyone that striveth for the mastery is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I want to pray one more time. Father, give us understanding of Your Word this morning. Would You communicate to our hearts by the Holy Ghost what You would have us to to gather from this, what You would have us to lay hold on. Open our eyes spiritually that we might see and our ears to hear You. In Jesus' name we pray. There's a little phrase at the end of verse 24. So run that you may obtain. And we're going to be talking about this today and next Sunday as well. Everyone who's running in a race is running. Okay, He says that. Know ye not that, that they that which run in a run, race run all, but one receiveth the prize. Everybody that's in the race is running. You know, probably one of the most famous races in in the United States, I mean, there's different ones, is the, is the Boston Marathon. And on Boston Patriots Day, once a year, they have the Boston Marathon. I think in the most recent marathon, they had uh, 27,000 people that's, that uh, signed up to run in the race. Before it even started, 400 and 574 bailed out and decided they didn't want to do it. Of those, so 22,426 people ran in the race. It's 26.2 miles long. That's a marathon, okay? Those last 2.2 miles I'm sure would get me, right? Uh, 26.2 miles, and more than 21,000 people completed the race, but one, one won the prize. One individual won the prize. And we're told here, Paul says, run that we may obtain. So I looked up that word obtain. So I, I, it means what you think it would mean, but it, it means to attain to, to take eagerly, to seize, to apprehend, to find, to possess. And the, we're told in the Word of God here that as believers, we're to run in such a way to possess, to seize, to lay hold on the prize or what's set before us. And... Uh, in a natural race, you know, described like the, the Boston Marathon, in a, a natural men, race, men run to obtain a corruptible crown. Okay, a corruptible crown. I, I think it's a big prize actually for the, for the Boston Marathon. I think it's $150,000 to the winner. But still, that's a corruptible crown. Okay, it's still, no matter, in a natural sense, what you're running for and what you're striving for is corruptible. That word corruptible, corruptible means perishable or decayed. It's not really a good thing. We're talking in a spiritual sense. Okay, uh, It's not necessarily evil, but it's not, uh, it's not lasting. It's perishable. They train. Whoever's running in this natural race, okay, the Boston Marathon, whatever it may be, they train and they discipline themselves and they strive after and they uh, deny themselves certain things that other people might have, probably in, in their training. Uh, they push themselves through a lot of pain, physically and so forth, all to obtain a perishable crown. It's temporal. It's fleeting. Okay? It's decaying. I'm not saying it has no value. And the Bible's not saying it has no value. It's simply saying what they're striving for, and they get it, they do it to it obtain a corruptible crown. It's not that there's no reward. It's that it's fleeting. It's for a moment of glory. Now when Paul was writing this uh, in the Corinthian church, we know the Holy Ghost wrote all the Word of God. He wrote this passage. It's for us today. But he was writing it. It made sense to the people of his day. Almost every Bible scholar believes he was referring to uh, the Isthmian games Okay, in this letter. And these Isthmian games were part of, they were games or competitions and they were, it was an integral part, sports was an integral part of their religious ceremonies. That sounds weird, but that's what it was. The, the sports was a big part of their ceremonies. And so in these Isthmian games that were held in Paul's day and in this part of the world, they held a, a festival uh, to honor Poseidon. Poseidon, that's the Greek god of the sea, right? Of earthquakes and water in the sea. And it, the, the festival consisted of 
you know, foot races, horse races, jumping, wrestling, boxing, throwing discus, throwing javelin, and horse, horse and chariot races as well. And when the winner would win each of these events, it was very coveted after and very much uh, something that was sought after. The prize in the games was a perishable wreath, just like you've probably seen in some illustrations. Perishable wreath that they put around their head, probably for a moment, be acknowledged as the winner and the adulation of men and so forth during that time. And so this is what he had in mind when he was saying that they do it. Everybody was running in the race. Chariot race, foot race, wrestling, boxing, whatever. Everybody's running in the race that was in the race. But they do it to obtain a prize. And only one wins the prize. I'm very thankful that there's a limit to the to the illustration of the comparisons because I don't believe at all, nor does the Word of God teach that only one obtains the prize. I'm not competing against you. You're not competing against me. Somebody we went to the Lord and they praised to receive Christ in the neighborhood over there by Foxy's. We're not competing against them. I'm, I'm running to receive the prize that God has for me and for my, for my life in Jesus Christ. And so we're not in competition. They do it to receive a corruptible, perishable, decaying prize. But we as the followers of Christ, that we may obtain an incorruptible prize. And there's a couple of things I think the Lord would have us to get from this this morning. Okay? When, when He specifically says, and this is the statement that we're going to focus on, the end of chapter 9, verse 24, the end of that verse says, So run that you may obtain... There's two thoughts that come to my mind in studying this and in preparing that I think the Lord would have me to get and us as a church to get. And that is in the so running that you may obtain. There's two thoughts to me there. One is a motive. Run for the purpose of obtaining. Run that you may obtain. All right. One one would have to do with uh, with as a born again man or woman to to obtain in the end or to seize or to possess all that God has ordained for me to have as a believer. I need to have that as a motive, right? I need to have that as something that, that uh, I lay hold on in my mind, in my heart, in my spirit. The other, and it's closely related to that, with the motive being established, I need to run in a manner that will be successful. Does that make sense? I need to run in a way that I will a- obtain. And so, again, the first one, the first motive part answers why. So run that you may obtain. Why do I run? I run that I may obtain. Okay? I run that I may not miss the prize, that I may obtain it. The second question, or the second part of so run that you may obtain, is answers how. How do you run then? I run in a manner that's going to be successful. Motive and manner. Okay? Motive and manner. And they go together. They're very uh, important. One is a matter of my inspiration. What moves me. What inspires me. What motivates me to run. Because it's not always easy to run as we're going to talk about. What desire do I have that my heart is fixed upon to to run after? to, To go through what I'm going through to obtain. What is my motive in running? And the second has to do with the manner in which we run. Having established the motive, I'm running to obtain the prize, okay? How can I run successfully to accomplish that? Right? I know these are simple thoughts, but to me it's very important. What what manner? I've established the motive. I want an incorruptible crown. And how do I run in order to obtain, obtain it? I don't want to miss it. I want to be successful. God tells me here in His Word, so run, so, that to me is a manner and a motive, so run that you may obtain. How do I live day by day? How do you and I as believers live day by day? Because it matters, doesn't it? We're saved in a moment. We're saved the moment you give your life to Christ. And if it's genuine, you really gave your life to the Lord, then we're really saved. That's not even a question anymore. But there's a whole lot that we talk about that is now, how am I to live this life as a saved man? How am I to run this race as a believer? What is the goal? What is the prize? And then how do I run to attain to it? 
to seize it, to lay hold upon it. I don't want to miss it. I want to lay hold on what God has inspired in my heart, if that's the right word, what He's placed in my heart. How do I run to attain it? Because there's a way and manner laid out in the Word of God for us to run. It's not different for, for one of you than it is for me. I say it all the time, our specific callings and service, that is different. We're not all cut out of a cookie cutter exactly the same. But a vast majority of our life is identical. We have the same Bible. We have the same God we serve. The same heaven we're going to. The same sin we were saved out of. You understand what I mean? The same blood of Jesus that's washed us. The same Holy Spirit in us. The same calling of God to be holy as He is holy. To, to, uh, to run the race that's set before us and so forth. Most of our life is similar in that in our Christian walk. We can encourage each other. We can provoke one another to love and good works. And then uh, you know, one individual might have a certain call of God upon their life, a certain ministry, a certain uh, something that they're called to. But we have to run. It's not up to you and I to run any old way we choose. You understand what I'm saying? And so much that's so different than the way the world is. The world is, especially when it comes to spiritual things, uh, moral things, lifestyles, choices. The world wants to think anything goes. What's right for Alberto might not be what's right for me, might not be what's right for Sherry. You just have to pick your own way to live life. But of all the things that should be the most disciplined, it ought to be this. And everything that's in, of all the things in life, of flavors and tastes and and choices that we can make, the one that's most clearly laid out for us is not what job you're going to do or what school you're going to go to or even if you're going to go get higher education after high school or anything like that. If you get married, stay single. The most important choice of all is the one that God gives us. You must be born again. It's not just any old choice that we want. And after we're saved, guess what? It's not just any old thing we choose after that. Because... Because He has laid out in His Word a manner in which we're to run that He knows is best, that is healthiest for us as believers, that he, that is uh, fitting or befitting of the God and Father that we say we know and serve, right? There's a way that He's lined out in His Word. And so, uh, I want us to talk today about the first part of that. And next week we'll talk about the second part. This is what I mean. When Paul says, so run that you may obtain. The first part being motive. What inspires me to run the race? I'm running to win. I'm running to, as a believer, I'm running to attain to and achieve what God has for me. If you ask a soldier, you know, they're mercenaries that are just hired soldiers, right? In the old Western movies, there might be a hired gun that some big rancher would hire to to protect his cattle or from, from thieves or whatever. And uh, he's just a hired gun. If somebody pays him more, he'd probably jump to that job. His heart's not in the, the fight, so to speak. It's a living. It's a job. And some people are that way. But, you know, a lot of soldiers, we think of are patriotic. We think of our nation and, and people that fought and, and died. Why did they do it? If you were to ask some, we just celebrated Pearl Harbor Day. And if there's not that many survivors still from World War II, but if you were to ask them why did they do it? Why did you fight in Guadalcanal in the, you know, over there in that part of the world around Japan in, in those conditions? Why did you do it? You had a young bride you just married. They would tell you that's why I did it. For my family. I did it so, uh, so that we won't all be speaking German one day. You know what I'm saying? They would tell you, uh, a lot of them would tell you, I love my family. I love my country. I love the Lord. I believe He's given us this nation. There were pretty high, lofty ideals that caused men to, in a physical sense, put their lives at danger and lay down their lives. Um, motive is extremely important. The motivation, why we do things. You know, I played, I played sports growing up. You know, I can think about guys maybe on my football team. And I always think back to some of my hardest times in football would have been in August 
before the season started, before school started and we're out there, it's a lot different now where they practice year round. But for us, we would start two weeks before school. You know, you've been eating Twinkies all summer and now you're going out there to, to play football and, and, you know, school starts in two weeks. And the, the heat, and we actually practiced at, at our school on ground that was about as, seriously, it was, it, it was as hard as this tile. There was no grass on it. It was hard like that wood right there. You know, you hit the ground, hit the deck, and all that kind of stuff, and they're running, and full pads and all that. And, and I would often think, why am I doing this? And some of the kids, uh, some of the, the guys on the team would, would quit. They wouldn't go all the way through that part. And, and honestly, you, if you ask them, well, what were you doing out here in the first place? You know, oh, I, my dad wanted me to play. You know what I'm saying? Or my parents or my brother played, so I thought I would try. But their heart wasn't really in it. And you'll find that. But motive is, is very important. We are as believers to run that we may obtain. And what I, what I think about this is that we have to judge or esteem that what Christ has for us is worth it. This is what we're going to talk about this morning. Um, what moves us, what motivates us to run the race? What is it or who is it that is set before us in our heart of hearts and in our minds that keeps us moving in a heavenly direction? We're ridiculed. We're society is not becoming more Christian. We're more and more the oddball and the outcast. Uh, what is it that keeps us moving in a heavenly direction? What is our goal? What is our purpose? Why do I live this way? You know, I got saved because I don't want to go to hell, for example. But why do I live this way day by day? So run that you may obtain. What inspires me? What is my inner strength, so to speak? We know it's the Lord and His Holy Spirit. But am I convinced? And this is a key word to me. Am I, am I convinced that it's worth it? Am I convinced that to go through life like this, not that it's miserable, I don't mean that. I'm saying that the Bible says many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. The Bible tells us we're strangers and pilgrims on the earth. We're going to read some of these scriptures. But am I convinced in my heart of hearts that what He has promised me, the incorruptible crown, so to speak, is worth it? Is the Lord worth it? Is all of this worth it? Do I have a clear, I would say, unclouded vision of what moves me on from day to day? Because if we don't, that's when people start tripping up and falling up. They know they're supposed to be doing it, but they forgot why. I know I'm supposed to go to church, but I can't really see why. I know I'm, I'm supposed to pray, gather with believers to pray, study His Word, and to abstain from all appearance of evil and not do this and not do that that everybody around me is doing. I know I'm supposed to do all these things, but if we lose the vision of why, remember the first part of this answers the question, why do I run? I run to obtain. There's a why to it all. I want to be pleasing to God. I want my life to glorify God. I want to know Him more. I want to be more like Him. I don't want to miss on one out on one single thing that God has me for me in this life or in the life to come. So I am convinced that it is worth it. I'm convinced, and you can't talk me out of it, that He's worth it. And that all that He's promised in His Word is true and that it's worth it. There is, uh, we go through struggles. Not only is it worth it, it's I value it and prize and esteem it more than all and above all. It's not just I really, really love God, but I really, really love this just as much. And maybe there'd be a conflict somewhere. Somewhere there'd be a conflict and I'll have to choose between the two. It should never be a choice. That's why the Bible says, seek you first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. That means first. It means not only... Uh, at first in time, but at first in preeminence and in everything. Uh, as ascending above all, seek first the kingdom of God. That means first means first. It means above all. And I know I've shared with y'all before because I've even said it before and heard it before, but I've 
fought it over when you're when you're maybe a coach getting his team ready or maybe a, someone's starting a business and he's having a, a, a team building thing with his employees and he wants to get his sales team motivated and maybe he's a Christian he says we believe here and you see the picture of the pyramid right here's the pyramid God's at the top and then the next layer is family we've seen these before and the next layer is job or job security or finances and then but below that maybe like entertainment late leisure time you've probably seen these pyramids but it and, and people have even used that in relationship with our christian's life and our walk with god but i don't believe that i don't believe that the lord's at the top of a pyramid the the way i see it maybe it just helps me i believe the lord is everything that the lord is to be everything and that everything else is like under a big umbrella. Yeah, they're important things. Family, okay? Job, you know, jobs, finances, homes, all that stuff, friends. But, but it's not God and then a close second behind it, here's my family. Because you know what? One day, I may wake up and I, I find that my close second kind of surpassed my first. And my family becomes more important to, to me than my walk with my Savior. And it's not supposed to be that way. He that loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh up not his cross and followeth me is not worthy of me. And so it's not a competition. Don't let it be in your heart. That just maybe this illustration helps me. But don't let the Lord be in competition with your family. Or in competition with your job. Because you may, at some point, well, there's a rub between my walk with God and my job, job security. What are you going to do then? But if it's all given to God, the Lord gives and He takes away, Job said. It's all given to God and none of it's in competition. It's His job that He gave me. I'm a steward of it. It's His family that He gave me, my family, to bring up my children and my and so forth in the, in the garden protecting it's been the pleasure of spending my time with my family certainly I would lay down my life for my family and so would y'all but don't let anything come a close second to the Lord it's all the Lord there has to be a motive and it has to be he's worth it he's worth it when things are slow when your walk with God may seem a little dry and it does when it seems a little boring, I'm being honest, seems that way. It's not, but to me, because my heart's grown a little cold, uh, it seems like I'm going through the motions. There has to be in each of us. I can't do it for you and you can't do it for me. We can encourage each other with the Word of God. There has to be in the end, I see Him and He's worth it. I see all that has for me. He has for me that He's laid out in His Word and it's worth it. I want to, I'll go through the afflictions. I'll go, I'll endure the hardships and the struggles because there are. There are those struggles and hardships specifically identified with the, Christ, the Christian life that are not part. Everybody, it rains on the just and the unjust. Everybody, worldly people that don't know the Lord and save people get cancer. They get rejected by people. Uh, all those things are common to man. But there are, are struggles and adversities and trials that are unique to the Christian life only. And there's times when it gets hard as to be a Christian in an unchristian world, to be a believer in an unbelieving family, uh, whatever it may be. There are times, many times, it gets hard. And we have to say, I still value that it's worth it to possess. Paul says we do it to obtain an incorruptible crown right an incorruptible that word means uh undecaying and listen to this it means undecaying immortal this is the definition of it, immortal the perishable crown perishes it decays the uncor incorruptible crown is undecaying immortal and had, it carries the, the meaning of continuance that's the crown that we're after now, you and I must be convinced and persuaded that this is unequaled. I know I'm being a little redundant here, but unequaled. That, that He surpasses 
everything. David said, and he didn't mean it in a perverted way, that your love surpasses the love of women. He, he knew the love of God and what it was like to walk with the Lord. You understand what I'm saying? There has to be that knowing that what He has for us is worth it. We looked at this Scripture really recently. I'll just quote it from 1 Peter 1.8. Whom having not seen... This is us, right? We see the, we see the things that are contrary to us. We see circumstances that are opposed to us. We see an ungodly world uh, increasing and coming against us. But the Lord, whom having not seen, you love. And though now you see Him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. How do we know that? What is Peter talking about? He's talking about setting Jesus in such a place that He's always in the forefront of our hearts and minds, that He's always our first love, and we're not like the church of Ephesus that loses our first love. They could come back. He rebuked them in Ephesus, right? Come back to where you're falling from. And, but to keep the Lord there, the Bible says, as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love Him. You say, okay, well, it just means we can't know it then. We can't know these heavenly prizes and what it's going to be like. But the Bible goes on to say in the very next verse, but the Spirit hath revealed them. So there is a knowing. There can be a knowing in the heart of everyone that's born again. The closer we get to Jesus, the more we value Jesus. The closer we get to the Lord, the more we value the eternal. The closer we get to the Lord, the more we value and know and maybe the picture that was real, real foggy is a little bit more clear. Right? Faith is going to end in sight. But there, there's a focusing of the vision where the, the hazy stuff starts falling away. And you start seeing Him. And the more you see Him, the more you want to see Him. And the more you say He's worth it. I'm running to obtain that. Because this other stuff is nothing. I can't honestly say that fully that it's nothing, but I'm wanting it to become nothing everything else in light of the Lord or comparison to the Lord. Um, <clears throat> I want to read just a, another couple of scriptures here. The Bible speaks of these saints of old who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, but it also says they wandered destitute and were in uh, animal skins and they lived in caves and they were sawn asunder and 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 burned at the st- burned and so forth. And they went through what they went through. And even Paul said to the to believers, I believe Paul wrote Hebrews in his day, he says, but call to remembrance the former days in which you were illuminated. You endured a great fight of afflictions. There's a lot that we go through as believers, but I've got to in the midst of that, and every believer of every age has to hang on to the promise has to hang on to the promise of the Lord. And we have to esteem in our heart of hearts that it's worth it. Mm-hmm. What does the Bible say about Demas? The Bible, you're not a well-known character in the Bible, but Demas, at one point, you read through some of the epistles, he was a co-laborer with Paul in the Gospel. And he's working with Paul. We, hear, we see him named. And then we see in 2 Timothy... When Paul's about to be beheaded and martyred, these guys are on the prize. He said, there's, there's, henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, has laid up for me, not for me only, but all those that love is appearing. When he's at that point in his life, he's telling Timothy in the second Timothy that uh, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. I can't tell you what happened to Demas' life in the specifics, but in the big picture, something in the world took preeminence over his love for Christ. And it caused him to forsake Paul. But obviously, he didn't just forsake the Apostle Paul. He must have forsaken the Lord. He loved this present world. What is your first love? Not first love with a close second and third. And sometimes they're interchangeable. But what is our first love? Above all, no competition, no rival. 
the Lord standing alone. We're talking about motive. So run that you may obtain. I'm running for that. I'm running for Him. I'm going through, enduring a great fight of afflictions because Christ is worth it. Turn with me in your Bibles. We'll read a couple more Scriptures here. In Hebrews chapter 11, I referred to some. One wonderful passage of Scripture. It says it far better than I could ever say what I'm trying to convey this morning. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. These all died in the faith. Speaking about these Old Testament saints, these great cloud of witnesses. Okay, you mentioned Abraham and Enoch and, and, and Abel and Noah and these others and Sarah and others. These all died in the faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. What is that, y'all? That's faith, right? It's faith that's fixed upon. They didn't receive everything God promised them by the time that they died. Why? Because there's an incorruptible crown waiting that we don't get before we die. There's a lot of things that are, are continuing. They're incorruptible, right? That don't decay. They died in the faith not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. we got to see them afar off. And that far off needs to stay in our, our vision. Not far, forgotten. It is far off, but it's not forgotten. Okay? Need, we need to be mindful. And they, listen, they, they saw them afar off, the promises of God. They were persuaded of them. That, and we're going to look at that definition in a minute. They embraced them and they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. That to me is almost like the faith of the saints right there in that one scripture. They died in the faith. They lived in the faith, obviously. They died in the faith. They didn't obtain everything God had for them, nor do we as believers in this life. But it says that they saw them afar off. They were persuaded of them. They embraced them or made them their own. This is what I'm clinging to. Picture somebody embracing something. And they confessed plainly that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Stranger is a stranger. It's not your native land. A pilgrim means you're not here for long. You're moving on. You're on a journey. We are, ne- we are both strangers and pilgrims. This is not our native land. We're strangers here on the earth and among lost men. And we are not here for long. We're pilgrims marching on and moving on. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. Verse 16, but now they desire a better country that is a heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He hath prepared for them a city. They didn't get the city in this life. They're getting the city as they're with the Lord. Maybe it's the new Jerusalem that's being referred to. They were all going to have it one day. But it's a permanent, glorious dwelling place. They had to have seen that by faith. They didn't see it physically. And they were persuaded. That word persuaded means convinced. Just listen to this. To assent to evidence and authority. So when it says they were persuaded of the promises of God, they assented to evidence and authority. God had given them some token by the Holy Ghost in their hearts, in their conscience, that these things are so. They're, they are. They're real. They're in store for you, they're for you. Okay, he had to given them, given them that token to assent to authority, uh, to believe, to assure, to obey, to trust, to agree with. And I like this last definition. This is a persuaded. Best of all, to rely by inward certainty. You couldn't have talked them out of it. Obviously, you couldn't have talked them out of it because they died at the mouths of lions. They were cut. They could have recanted. They could have gotten themselves out of the jam a lot of times, and they chose not to because they relied upon by inward certainty that I'm not. A, this is not my home. God has a home for me, and without question, they esteemed, esteemed what He had for them better. Okay, better. There was a certainty that they relied upon in their hearts. They, these saints of old, y'all, that we read about, and a lot of them we know their names, most of them we do not know their names, but they, these saints of Almighty God, by faith, they ran the race. And y'all, we're to do the same thing. 
It says in the next chapter, Hebrews, wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. I can tell you who we are. We as the believer in the church age, the great cloud of witnesses are the saints of God that have gone before. They trusted God by faith. We are compassed about. Not as our enemies, but part of our family. Okay, as by children of faith in the living God. We don't run any race that's set before us. I mean, we don't run any race of our choosing. We run the race that is set before us by our God and our Savior. And the one that He chose that He set before us. And to these saints of old, it was worth it. To them, Christ was worth it. To them, uh, obtaining the eternal crowns and rewards that God had for them. Was, would give them one day was worth it. And it was worth it all through their journey. All the way to the end, it was worth it to them. They said, it's, it's worth it to me. I, I finished the course and I want to receive what God has for me. Paul said the same thing, right? I finished the course. His life as a believer was not an easy life. If you'd ask Paul, would you trade it for anything? He would say, are you a fool? Not in a million years I would not trade this life and trade Christ and knowing Christ and what He has for me. Would you say, has it been easy, Paul? He would say, again, are you a fool? I've been shipwrecked. I've been beat. I've been in the days and nights out in the ocean. I've been in, in dangers and perils among my brethren, among strangers. I've been without food. I've been without water. I've been in prison. I've been beat. Uh, with the stripes upon my back, He's been stoned and left for dead. Uh, was it worth it? Absolutely. You have to. Esteem Christ as being worth it. I have to esteem the Lord Jesus as being worth it. These saints of old, this is what moved them forward in the midst of great adversity. They were running to obtain. And all the while they're running to obtain, they've got His promises in their minds and in their hearts. Okay, To them, it was like uh, uh, imprinted upon their hearts and minds. They would wake up and, and there's the Lord and His promises. You picture, uh, uh, I think about this all, all the time, probably not often enough when I pray for the persecuted church in our day. And I think about believers say in North Korea, they say it's the most hostile, persecuted church you know, na- nation in the world against Christianity. And it's freezing cold, and there's, this country's already broke and starving to death. And then these prisoners for serving the Lord. They're actually trying to escape to China. That's how bad North Korea is. I mean, seriously, they escaped to China to get away from North Korea. And there's Christians set up along that border to try to house them and hide them and, and get them across. But, but they have to be thinking when they wake up and they're starving again. Guess, guess what? I'm starving today like I was yesterday. You know what I mean? And I'm freezing cold. I'm laying on a cold concrete floor and I don't have a blanket to wrap around me. They have to be thinking, God's worth it. Amen. The Lord's worth it. <clears throat> this is not my home. And we have to esteem the Lord as being worth it. Amen. Because there are times in this life, more times than we know, and more times for people, especially persecuted like this, where we're tempted to quit. I'm going to be bringing this to a close. We're tempted to quit. We're tempted to give up. Not that we want to go to hell, okay? But as believers, we're tired of the fight sometimes. I'm just tired of the fight with family. I'm tired of the fight with the coworkers. I'm tired of the, I, I, it'd be easier just to, you know, here's a salmon swimming upstream. You know what? If I turn around, I'll just float back out to the sea. I can lay like on the inner tube, you know? Go like I'm tubing on the tangible hall. Um, I'm swimming upstream the whole way. Grizzly bears are trying to eat me. Bald eagles are grabbing at me. You know, fishermen are catching, are, are trying to. I always say that about those salmon. I know it's just a, a natural thing, but they're going to they're gonna get to the place where they spawn upstream from the ocean. They live two years in the ocean. They swim back up the same river they came out of. They're going to get where they came from or they're going to die trying, but they're not stopping. Think about it. I'm getting there or I'm dying trying, but you won't see me going the other way. Amen. And I want to say it about my own life. I want to say it about everyone in this group. I might 
not get where you think I should get and so forth in this life, but I'm to tell you what I'm not doing. I'm not going back that way. He saved me out of that. I know what that's like. I've been there. I've been there as an adult in college. I know what that's like. I don't want to go back to it. He saved me out of it. And so I'm going to get where I'm going. I'm going to die trying, but I'm not going that way. And so when we're when we live or die, he's worth it. Live or die, this world's not my home. Live or die with the Lord. This world has nothing to offer me. Live or die, he's worth it. Face cruel mockings, face hardships, be rejected, be scorned, be mistreated, be ridiculed, be passed over for a promotion because you're a professor at LSU and you're a Christian. Be passed over for a promotion. Be fired because you're a Christian. Don't go along with the status quo of evolution. Whatever comes my way, He's worth it to me. Because the one that got the promotion might die tomorrow. They certainly will die one day. And if they die without Jesus, they're going to be in a lost eternity. I'm not. It's worth it to me to go on. I'm not talking about a pity party like poor us. I'm talking about reality that it can be hard to go through life as a believer. We better, better esteem the Lord as being worth it. We can cultivate that by pressing into the Lord even more. I do not want to be of those that Paul mentions in, in Hebrews 10, of those that draw back unto perdition, but of those that uh, believe to the saving of the soul. Believe all the way through, so to speak. I want to believe all the way through. Because something infinitely more valuable waits for all of us. Our God has promised that to us. And the Bible says He's not a liar. That promise can get really dim. It's like you're, you're hanging on with fingertips. You can't see it clear. Ask God to make it clear again. Show me again, Lord, that it's worth it. I know in my heart of hearts You're worth it. It's worth it. Help me right now. Strengthen me again. I want to read this from Revelation 22. And there shall be no more curse. This is in that eternal state we just finished studying. In the, in the new Jerusalem. That holy city in that eternal state. Listen what it's going to be like. There shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it. It's not here right now. His, his throne is in our hearts, so to speak. Christ is in our hearts. He's in heaven. His Spirit's in us. But the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it in this new city, and His servants shall serve Him, and they shall see His face, and His name shall be in their foreheads. This is just part of what we have waiting for us. I need to look at the Scriptures. I need to say hallelujah for the Scripture and thank you for it. And I need to take the Scripture and plant it in my heart in this day in which I live in the days that are ahead. I want to close with just a few thoughts. The Holy Spirit gives us strength, y'all. We're not on our own. It's not sheer willpower. It is discipline. It is a will. He can't do it without our will. Okay? But our will to, to be made willing, if you know what I mean. Our will to continue. Now, Lord, help me. And we mean that. He, he strengthens us by His Spirit. So run that you may obtain. Run with the motive and the purpose of obtaining. David, why do you seek Him early? And why do you set the Lord always before you? Why do you pant after Him like a deer looking for water? Why do you do that? He would say, because He's he's the lover of my soul. Because His love is better than life. Because I've set the Lord always before me. I shall not be moved. Because in His presence, there's fullness of joy. Paul, why do you bring your body under subjection? Why do you call all your former gains that you had, count them as dung compared to knowing Christ? He would say, because before, I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, the chief of all sinners, but I obtained mercy. Moses, why do you, when you came of age, did you refuse? To be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter and chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than enjoy the treasures of of Egypt for a season because I I esteem the riches of Christ more. 
Amen. Woman, why are you? Why are you bending down there, crying and washing Jesus' feet with your tears? Why are you using your own hair to, to dry his feet off? She would say, because he's forgiven me. I would say, parents, why do you raise your children in the church and bring them to church and Sunday school and music practice over and over and over again? Why do you steer them to away from what the world values and steer them to Christ? Why do you teach them that success in the Lord is is more important than success in sports. And you prove it by the way you live your life. Because I want my children to know this Christ that I know. Because I want them to know joy unspeakable and full of glory. Because I'm, I'm your heavenly father. I'm your heavenly mother. But you have a heavenly father that I want you to know. Because I'm going to be your friend as we get older, son or daughter. But I want you to know there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. This is why we do what we do. We have a motive. We run to obtain. We have a prize that's set before us. I want to close with this. Indeed, you can come up. First Peter 1, 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4. Blessed be the God of our Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's from, from sin. And it says to. That's the directions. He's bringing us to. An, in, an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. If it were not so, Jesus told His disciples, I would have told you. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. Okay? I'm going to prepare a place for you. Well, I don't see it. It's been 50 years. I had not seen it. 55, 75. Been suffering a lot of persecution. Haven't seen it yet. But He puts it in our hearts. In Ecclesiastes, it says, in one of the translations, for He had set eternity in the hearts of men. We know it. And we know not just eternity, but the eternal goodness of God and the rewards of God and the things that He has promised to those that know and walk with Him. These altars are open. There's one more Scripture I'm going to read while the altar time is open and while you're praying. But I pray somebody get hold of God. And if you're feeling like drawing back and you're feeling like, I don't really know if I want to keep this race up. I don't know if I can keep it up. He will strengthen you. He will encourage you. But we, like the saints of old, have to be persuaded and convinced that we see those promises afar off. I'm persuaded of them. We have to embrace them. And then we have to declare plainly to a lost world and to each other, this world's not my home. I'm moving on. Come to these altars and meet with the Lord that motive has to be in our hearts, so run that you may obtain. For which cause, altars open, for which cause, Paul says, we faint not. But though our outward man perisheth, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at those the things which are seen, but are at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. That is the truth. Thus saith the Lord. That is what He is telling us. And it has to be true in my own heart. That what is seen is temporary. What is not seen is eternal. And that's what I've got to see by faith. And Father, we come before You. In the mighty name of Jesus, give us eyes of faith to see the eternal, to see what You have in store, an inheritance in Christ, incorruptible, undefiled, that faith is not away, reserved in heaven for us, for us specifically, for the least of the saints, for the newest believer, for the youngest believer, for the oldest saint, the things You have for us, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, neither has entered to the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love Him. God, I thank You by Your Spirit, even this morning, You would reveal them to us, God. 
Help us not be of those that company that draws back under perdition, but that believes unto the saving of the soul. We love you, Jesus, and thank you.